Cameron. Uh, I am, um, as Dr. Ankors mentioned, I am a, a pediatric cardiologist in Cincinnati. Um, and I did my residency in pediatrics actually overseas in Beirut. Um, so um, I really enjoy um, practicing medicine in um, uh, other countries as well. And I am super excited to talk to you. Uh, now, it's meant to be interactive, but I, I understand that the internet uh, connection may not be the best all the time. So maybe we can go through the slides and then have some time for questions and answers at the end. Uh, if you can hear me well, just uh, make some noise. Just let me know that you can hear me now. All right, wonderful. So let's go ahead and start. So the title of this uh, lecture will be Mending Broken Hearts in Pumpkins. Um, or heart failure in children. And the reason I thought this would be a good topic to discuss today is that it's really important for every pediatrician and every physician. Um, as you can see heart failure as a resident, you can see heart failure as a uh, pediatrician, you can see a heart failure as an internal medicine specialist, you can see it if you're working in the neonatal ICU as a neonatologist, you can see it in the um, intensive care unit. You can see it if you are practicing um, med -peds, which is kind of like a general practice. That's a specialty that I wasn't familiar of until um, I came to the United States. Um, and then um, for all subspecialties, subspecialties, including nephrology, endocrine, ID, hemonc, global health, and ED physicians, you may encounter patients with heart failure in the pediatric age group. Um, so the objectives of this uh, discussion today is to discuss the definition of heart failure, the causes of heart failure in children, the signs and symptoms of heart failure in children, the available treatments that we have for heart failure, and then finally we'll briefly mention some new modalities of treatment. To do that, we will have four cases that you may encounter in your day-to-day -day practice, and then we will have some discussion points on each case. So this first case is a direct admit to the hospital medicine team or to the general team. Um, the child, um, the main reason for admission was failure to thrive and failure to gain weight. Um, the child is a five week old female who was a full term um, uh, patient. Um, she had a murmur at birth and was found to have a ventricular septal defect or a VSD. She was seen in cardiology clinic at age of two weeks, and this is her um, follow-up appointment at five weeks when she was found to have uh, poor weight gain and was admitted to the hospital. So um, today's visit by her uh, pedi uh, primary pediatric care noticed that she lost some weight from the two-week visit. She's still at her birth weight, and we know that children by the age of five weeks should be um, above their birth weight and should be gaining weight, so she's definitely not gaining weight. The mom reported that she gets tired easily with feeding, and it takes her about 40 minutes to finish her bottle. Um, her physical exam showed, sorry, her physical exam showed that her heart rate was 170, so that is tachycardia for her age. And that's when 70 was she, when she was sleeping. So she wasn't even fussy or anything like that. She was tachypnic, you can notice that, but she does not seem to be in distress. She, ha she seems to be happy and tachypnic. Um, her, she has a holosystolic four out of six murmur with a thrill over the left lower sternal border. And she also has hepatomegaly and you can feel her liver six centimeter below the coastal margin. Um, so by definition, she's actually in heart failure and I will tell you why. So heart failure is defined as a cardiac output that's insufficient to meet the metabolic demand of the body. And as you know, the cardiac output is defined as the stroke volume times the heart rate. Stroke volume is affected by the preload of the ventricle, contractility, and afterload of the ventricle. Um, and in adults, heart failure is um, for the most part due to poor contractility, which is mainly due to myocardial infarction, However, in children, it may have multiple etiologies, including increased preload or sometimes decreased preload, increased afterload, decreased contractility, and arrhythmias. So in, uh, in pediatrics, as opposed to adults, heart failure is multiple syndromes and not just one disease. 
Um, it can be caused by cardiac malformations associated with excessive preload or volume overload. It can be caused by cardiac malformations associated with excessive afterload, and this is the cases when there is left ventricular outflow trapped obstruction and coarctation. It can be um, caused by disorders of contractility, and this is what we see in cardiomyopathy patients and some congenital heart disease patients. And it can be caused by arrhythmias and uh, non-cardiac reasons for heart failure as well. Um, so the first two etiologies are what we usually see in patients who had a congenitally malformed heart or congenital heart disease. And the last three uh, is what we see in patients with structurally normal heart. So contractility problems, arrhythmias, or non-cardiac reasons for heart failure. So it's an imbalance between the um, uh, demand and the supply. So it can be caused by low cardiac output. And this is what we see in cases where you have high preload, high afterload, or poor contractility and arrhythmias. Or it can also be caused by an increased demand from the body uh, for output, which is what we see in cases of anemia, sepsis, or thyrotoxicosis. And I cited here a really nice review uh, in pediatrics in review in 2010 um, for you to take a look when you have some time. It's a really nice and easy quick read. All right, so uh, our patient was in heart failure. So um, in cases of VSD, what happens, so you can see this is a picture of a diagram of the heart. This is the left ventricle and the left atrium. This is the ventricular septal defect. And this is the right atrium and the right ventricle. So what happens in cases of ventricular septal defect is that the deoxygenated blood will come through the superior and the inferior vena cava, crosses through the tricuspid valve, and goes to the pulmonary artery. In addition to that, some of the oxygenated blood that comes through the pulmonary veins will come to the left ventricle and then through the VSD directly to the pulmonary artery. And that will result in more blood going to the pulmonary artery as opposed to the blood going through the aorta. Um, and that will result in more blood coming through the pulmonary veins. So what happens is that you will have volume overload on the left side, as you can see here, which will result in increase in the left atrial pressure. And that will result in pulmonary edema, pul uh, increased pulmonary stiffness, and that will result in increased work of breathing and tachypnea that we saw in our patient. Now, tachypnea in newborns and in infants is one of the hardest things that the infants need to do. So uh, that would result in increased metabolic demand as well, and the child will stop growing uh, due to that as well. So in terms of the epidemiology, heart failure in children is common. It's seen in 15 to 25% of children who have structural heart disease, um, and they will develop heart failure at some point in their life. And it can be as common as a ventricular septal defect as you saw in this case. Um, so many of these patients who has a large ventricular septal defect will present in heart failure. Luckily, they will have a murmur which will um, make the diagnosis uh, more straightforward. And then about 40% of patients with cardiomyopathy will develop heart failure that will require transplantation or causes death. Um, it's also not a cheap problem, and this problem is getting better, bigger and bigger uh, for us in the United States and around the world. So this is a study that used a, a database in the United States, um, which tracks all the causes of hospitalization. It's called the SUP uh, uh, database, or the KITS database, and it's an inpatient database. And that study noted that between 2003 and 2006, there was a significant increase in the number of admissions due to heart failure, and that the hospital charges in 2006 in US dollars was $1.8 billion. So it's a really, really very expensive problem. It results in a lot of resource utilization um, around the world. So in terms of the compensation mechanisms, um, most, you know, like when heart failure starts, it's kind of like a vicious cycle. It starts with a low cardiac output, which will, which will lead to buildup of um, toxic metabolites, which will um, result in lower blood pressure and vasodilation at the capillary and arterial level. Um, and that will um, trigger and activate the sympathetic um, nervous system. It will activate the renin angiotensin uh, aldosterone pathway, and it will result in inflammation, 
and uh, that will also result in cardiac remodeling and, uh, and that will um, result in um, worsening in the low cardiac output and worsening ventricular function and heart failure. Now the body tries to, um, you know, like uh, tries to compensate for that by uh, secreting more um, uh, some beneficial uh, substrates like the BMP and the AMP and the growth hormone and the IGF-1, which will increase the contractility and also causes some diuresis and some uh, sodium diuresis, which will um, result in improvement in some of the preload. But it's a vicious cycle when it starts. Um, and um, this is just one slide about cardiac remodeling. So this is the normal heart. Uh, this is uh, someone with myocardial uh, on the right side. As you can see here, this is someone with myocardial infarction or dilated cardiomyopathy. So what happens in these cases that the ventricle gets dilated and thinned. And what happens is that the myocardial length will increase. However, the myocardial width will increase only slightly. And in addition to that, there will be extensive fibrosis that will result in myocardial death and then advanced cardiac dysfunction. And that's the vicious cycle that we talk about. So when that remodeling starts, if we don't do anything to try to stop it, that would result in worsening fibrosis and worsening heart failure symptoms. As opposed to patients who has chronic hypertension or aortic valve stenosis or coarctation, what happens is that pathological hypertrophy will happen and there will be an increase in the myocardial length and myocardial width as well. In addition, fibrosis will be a late finding. And then finally, systolic dysfunction will be a really late finding. Now, some patients who exercise a lot or during pregnancy, there will be some physiologic hypertrophy of the heart, as you can see here. So there will be an increase in the myocardial length and the myocardial width, but there will be no fibrosis and no cardiac dysfunction. And that's the physiologic response to exercise or to pregnancy. And that's what we see in athlete's heart. In terms of the symptoms of heart failure, I thought it would be useful to discuss the symptoms in different age groups. So in newborns, as you saw in the first case, uh, they present with feeding difficulty and prolonged feeding time. So a lot of times the mom will tell you that it's taking, you know, like 40 minutes or 30 minutes to finish like one ounce or like 30 mLs of uh, milk. So um, this is definitely not normal. It can also uh, uh, present with diaphoresis or sweating, especially during eating. It will uh, present with tachypnea and tachycardia. Um, and because of that, the child will not wait, uh, gain weight. You may or may not find the murmur, depending on what co what's causing the uh, heart failure in the first place. If there is a murmur, it's good because it will help us with the diagnosis and direct us to the cardiac etiology for these problems. And then you can find hepatomegaly on the abdominal exam. Uh, when you feel the extremities, they can be uh, cool with weak pulses. Um, and what we see in heart failure in adults in terms of the RALs and the peripheral edema are rare unless there is pneumonia associated with heart failure or the congestive heart failure in these patients is very severe. Now in children, we start having more symptoms that are similar to adults. So they may present with dyspnea on exertion or rest. They may present with orthopnea and cough. They may also have fatigue and weakness, which is a late finding um, and then a lot of times they will have tachycardia and tachypnea on exam. They will be malnourished and they may have S3 gallop on exam and, and then poor peripheral pulses and poor peripheral perfusion. They may have jugular vein distension, hepatomegaly, and then finally they will develop peripheral edema, ascites, and pleural effusions. So this is kind of like similar to the older um, uh, adults and to the teenagers as well. Now the diagnosis, a lot of times we start with a chest X-ray if we don't know what's going on. And on chest X-ray, what you will see is that the blood flow is redirected to the apex of the lung, as you can see here. And then you will see also interstitial pulmonary edema. Um, you, and as you can see here, you can see curly B lines, which you see in adults with pulmonary edema as well. And you will see more fluids in the uh, lung fissures, as you can see in this chest X-ray here. And in addition to that, you will see cardiomegaly. So um, that could be a, an important sign that will direct you that this is the heart that's causing all of these symptoms.
Now, the EKG is not super helpful in telling you what's going on, but it can be a good screening test. So if the EKG is normal, it doesn't tell you anything, but if the EKG is abnormal, it may direct you that this is a cardiac problem. And then echocardiogram, which is the main diagnostic modality for this patient population, or even if you don't have cardiology now, um, there is, um, you can do a bedside ultrasound to tell you about the cardiac function and can tell you also about the structure of the heart and tell you if there is a major structural defect as well. Now, now we diagnose heart failure. It is helpful and important to, um, like any other diagnosis, to um, uh, stage it into different stages. Um, so, stage, so the um, International Society of Heart and Lung Transplant and the American College of Cardiology and the American Heart Association put together a classification of heart failure in children, kind of like similar to the NYHA groups that we see in adults. So stage one is at risk for developing heart failure. Um, and these are the patients who has congenital heart defects, who has family history of cardiomyopathy, or they are exposed to anthracycline. These patients are at risk. They are completely asymptomatic. So they call them stage A heart failure. Um, so they are not really in heart failure right now, but they are at risk for developing heart failure. Now stage B is the one who had abnormal uh, cardiac structure or function with no symptoms of heart failure. These are the patients who has univertricular hearts, asymptomatic cardiomyopathy. So just like mildly depressed function, but, um, but they don't have any symptoms again. And then um, they, had, they may have also repaired congenital heart disease. Now, the, the two stages that we really care about clinically are the stage C and stage D. So stage C is abnormal cardiac structure or function who had past or present symptoms of heart failure. Um, so these are uh, the patients who had repaired or unrepaired congenital heart defects or had cardiomyopathy. And then stage D is similar to stage C. However, they, uh, they will have abnormal cardiac structure or function, but they are dependent on continuous infusion of uh, inotropes. So these are the patients who are really sick. You put them in the ICU uh, for inotropes or for prostaglandin to keep the ductus arteriosus open, um, or they are requiring uh, mechanical support or mechanical ventilation to keep them alive and to keep their cardiac output adequate for their body. So these are the really sick patients, um, which is the stage D. Now there is another classification that Dr. Ross proposed. Uh, it's used mainly for um, classifying patients for research purposes. Um, but what I wanted to show you here is that that classification is different by, um, by age. So between zero to three months, it gives you kind of like 10 different symptoms, as you can see here. And for each symptom, you can have a score of zero, a score of one, or a score of two. And then you add all of these scores and you give the patient a, a score for how severe the heart failure is. So just wanted to show you again how important feeding is for heart failure. So GI symptoms and feeding abnormalities are really critical for heart failure symptoms in children. So as you can see here, uh, for patients between zero to three months, uh, if they uh, are eating uh, more than three and a half ounces, they score zero. And if they are eating less than two and a half ounces, they will score two. Um, and then similar scores are for time of feeding, uh, for breathing, respiratory rate, heart rate, perfusion, hepatomegaly. Um, we also measure BMP or NT pro BMP, and that can be a helpful marker for how bad the heart failure is. Um, in addition, ejection fraction by echo and AV valve insufficiency. Now, the ROS classification, as I mentioned, is age-based for the pediatric heart failure. There are 10, uh, 10 items, as I mentioned, with a maximum score of 20 because on each item, you, the child can score zero, one, or two. And then after that, the children are classified into class one, uh, which are the children who has zero to five points on these questions. Um, and then class four is the most severe, which is the patients who had 16 to 20 points. Now, I just wanna show that it's also different for uh, children between four to 12 months. Um, and again, feeding and weight gain are really important markers of heart failure. 
Um, and then between the age of one to three, you will see that feeding again comes first and growth comes second. So these are most importantly, uh, very important clues. Uh, if a mom is telling you that the child is not eating and not growing, um, to worry about the uh, cardiac function in that child. And again, even in um, uh, older children, nausea and vomiting and growth are very important signs of heart failure. Okay, so now we focused and we said that um, feeding is a really important uh, problem in patients with heart failure and growth abnormalities are really important in heart failure. And the reason they have growth and feeding abnormalities is that when they have a normal heart function, they will have gastrointestinal malabsorption. So there is less blood going to the gut and they cannot absorb the nutrition that we are giving them. So that will result in malnutrition. In addition to that, they will be very tired to eat. So they will not have enough energy and they will also be breathing fast and that will result also in inadequate um, dietary intake and that will result in malnutrition. And importantly also, they will be breathing fast and their heart rate is fast. So their metabolic demand is also increased. All of these things can result in malnutrition in children with heart failure. And that's why it's really important to focus on the nutritional status for patients with heart failure. Now, in terms of treatment of heart failure, so um, many of these patients get admitted to the hospital and we treat them by first trying to increase their nutrition and we try to address that. And we do that by increasing the amount of calories in their formula they are taking if possible, or by putting a um, different mechanism for them to eat. So we sometimes put an NG tube or we put a G tube if they can't eat anything and give them some nutrition through that. In addition to that, um, we use multiple medications. So the first medication we use in any patient with heart failure is usually diuretics. Diuretics are good, they are available, they are um, relatively affordable, um, and they have been in use for a long period of time. So we know that they, um, they do not cost a lot of um, money and they, we know that the safety of them is um, well established. Um, the reason we use diuretics in heart failure is that it augments the volume status by um, excretion water and sodium, and it decreases the preload on the ventricle, and that would result in decreased wall stress and um, decrease in the PMP. Uh, it also improves the symptoms, and that's the real benefit of diuretics um, short term. Um, and there was no studies that showed that diuretics will improve survival, neither in children or in adults but it helps with symptoms, it helps with pulmonary edema, but it does not, um, you know, like it does not um, affect the mechanism of the heart failure. So it's not gonna slow the progress. It's not gonna slow the remodeling. So it usually does not affect survival, but it will just improve the symptoms. And then as I showed here, so um, these are uh, where most diuretics uh, work. And the diuretic that we use the most is furosemide, or we call it in the United States Lasix. Um, and it affects the loop of Henley and um, results in excretion of the water and salt from it. And that's the mechanism of, uh, that it works in. The other uh, medicine that we use is spironolactone, which affects this ascending tub tubule here, uh, or the distal convoluted tubule. And we can also use um, thiazides, which also assess, uh, uh, affect the distal convoluted tubule, as you can see here. <coughs> so the second medication I'm going to talk about today is aldosterone receptor antagonists. And um, what I mean by that is um, a medicine called spironolactone or there is another medicine called eplerinone. Spironolactone has been in practice for a long period of time, and it works pretty well in heart failure. The data in children comes from adults. So um, you, you may or may not be familiar with this RAILS trial, but it's an important and old trial that happened in 1999 and was published in the New England Journal of Medicine, which is the most prestigious journal that we have in the United States. And what that study showed is that these are the patients who were on spironolactone with heart failure, and these are the patients who were on placebo. On the y-axis, you see the probability of survival, and in the x-axis, you see how many months these patients survive. 
And this kind of survival analysis is called the Kaplan-Meier curve. But you can see here that the patients on spironolactone had superior survival compared to the patients on placebo. And that's why it's now a mainstay um, to use it in adults. However, we don't have large controlled studies in children compared to adults, um, in part because of heart failure, because heart failure is a very heterogeneous problem in children. As you can see, like it had um, multiple causes and um, it can be caused by congenital and acquired heart disease. So as I mentioned, that RALS trial in adults was very impactful and showed that this medication decreased the mortality by 30% in adults. Um, there was 31% uh, reduction in cardiac mortality itself. So the first one was all-cause mortality. This is cardiac mortality. And then there was 35% reduction in hospitalization rates. So um, the need for these patients to be admitted to the hospital. Uh, and the way it works and the way we think it works is that aldosterone will increase that uh, remodeling problem um, resulting in increased fibrosis and apoptosis in the myocytes, and that will lead to fatal arrhythmias in these patients. And that's why if you use aldosterone, uh, uh, sorry, if you use spironolactone, you may be able to reverse that process, and that will result in an improvement uh, in mortality in this population. Now, the other medicine that we also use a lot in pediatrics, uh, mainly based on adult data, is the angiotensin-converting enzyme inhibitors. Um, the ones that we have in the United States for children, we have Inalapro, we have Lisinopro, and many others. Um, so it works uh, to decrease the afterload, so it's afterload reduction. And adult studies showed decreased remodeling with improved cardiac output, decreased hospitalization, and decreased mortality in asymptomatic patients, um, which is the ACC or AHA stage A. Now, uh, you can see here, so um, this is how it works. So the angiotensin converting enzyme works on the um, renin angiotensin uh, pathway. And um, when the renin is uh, secreted, it converts, um, to angiotens uh, it, uh, uh, converts angiotensinogen to angiotensin A1. And that enzyme or the angiotensin converting enzyme will convert angiotensin 1 to angiotensin 2. Um, and angiotensin 2 is the bad guy. So it causes vasoconstriction. It, um, uh, it causes also um, some uh, adverse remodeling or like a bad remodeling of the uh, left ventricle. So if we can reverse that process, that would result in a significant improvement in heart failure and decrease in mortality in adults. However, in children, we use it, but we don't have great data. Um, it is reasonable to use it as an empiric therapy in children without ventricular dysfunction um, who were stage A and B, uh, but has not shown symptom improvement or slower progression. So due to that, we keep it for symptomatic patients. So uh, that's based on several small short-term studies, which support the use in symptomatic stage C patients with volume overload, dilated cardiomyopathy, or left ventricular systolic dysfunction. All right, so now I'm gonna uh, move to case two, um, and uh, we will go from there. We still have a couple more cases to go through. So case two is a 10-day-old infant who was brought to the emergency department. He was found to have rapid breathing and poor breastfeeding with uh, worsening over the past 24 hours. He is becoming more lethargic for the last two hours, according to the mom, and, and he previously was well with unremarkable prenatal history. So I would say this is a really common um, presentation to the emergency department, so you should be aware of that presentation here. Um, on physical exam, the child is afebrile. His heart rate was 180, respiratory rate, he was tachypneic breathing really fast, it was 80. His blood pressure was 85 over 50. And interestingly, his oxygen saturation in his arm was 95%. However, he appeared ill. He was in respiratory distress, very fussy, and has a weak cry. And on your exam also, you notice that the baby was pale. His capillary refill was four seconds. The normal in babies is much less than two seconds. And he was sweaty to touch. 
you could not feed his femoral pulses despite multiple trials. Now you went ahead and sent a blood gas, we call it here ISTAT, and um, the pH was 7.1, so he was really acidotic. Um, his CO2 was 30, so um, his CO2 was not the problem, so the CO2 was low. And then um, there was a base a deficit of minus 10, that tells you that there is a, um, uh, a metabolic acidosis here, and his lactate was seven. So what this child had was a cardiac malformation that results uh, in excessive afterload, which is the second etiology for heart failure in children. Um, and most commonly, this baby may have coarctation of the aorta. So these patients usually will have the coarctation right by the, where the ductus arteriosus comes in. And when the ductus arteriosus closes, um, typically in the first week of life, they will present very sick and in extremis as this baby presented to the emergency department. This presentation can also be uh, seen in any ductal dependent uh, lesion uh, of the systemic circulation. So this is what we see in patients with aortic stenosis and also with hypoplastic left heart syndrome. So anything like aortic stenosis or if there is hypoplastic left heart, anything that will depend on the duct to deliver the systemic uh, circulation will present like this. Now, um, if it's a pulmonary blood flow issue that's dependent on the ductus, in addition to that presentation, they may present with cyanosis, and that will be your clue for diagnosis in these patients. All right, so the treatment for heart failure in this case, and you will see that the treatment here is very different from the previous patient who we try to increase the nutrition, um, we try to... Um, give him some medications and then send him to the, to the operating room for correction for his VSD. While this patient, we're gonna start on prostaglandin infusion to open the ductus arteriosus. We will do some supportive care with inotropes, diuretics and ventilator support, and um, we will do surgical repair as well. So first we try to stabilize the patient, uh, admit him to the hospital, put him in the ICU for a couple of days, and then the surgical repair will follow. Um, you notice that the patient was very acidotic, so it would be helpful to try to um, uh, improve his cardiac function and his general status before we send him to the operating room. Um, so just one word about the uh, screening protocol now we have in the United States. So right now, before we send any baby home from the newborn nursery after delivery, we do something called critical congenital heart defect screening. And this is supported by multiple organizations in the United States. This is the American College of Cardiology, American Heart Association, and the American Academy of Pediatrics. Um, and if there is a child in the well baby nursery, or if um, the child is being, uh, you know, like right before discharge, what we do is we put a pulse oximeter very simply on the arms and feet of that child. Um, so if there is desaturation in the arm or if there is a difference between the arms and feet in terms of the saturation, we go ahead and we obtain an echocardiogram just to simplify that protocol as much as I can. Um, and um, this is really a simple protocol. All nurseries now bought a pulse oximeter and they kind of like use that protocol. And typically, we repeat it three times. So when a child has an abnormality, we repeat it three times. Uh, and if it continues to be positive, then we will go ahead and call cardiology and get an echocardiogram. So this is just to avoid uh, false positivity and avoid resource utilization, getting multiple echoes that are not needed. So I will go ahead and move to case three right now. So the case three is an eight-year-old female who presented with shortness of breath. She had five days of cold and cough symptoms, and now she had worsening of her fever and cough, and also reported some vomiting for the last few days. On the physical exam, she was tachycardic. She was afebrile now. She had weak peripheral pulses and cold extremities with a capillary refill of two to three seconds, so mildly long. In this age, we want it to be below two seconds. Her cardiac exam showed no murmur, but she had a Gallup uh, S3 heard on exam as well. So the ER physician um, was expecting it's likely pneumonia and they went ahead and they got a chest X-ray. And as you can see on this chest X-ray, uh, 
the heart is really large, so it's like more than 50% uh, of the intercostal dimension here. Um, and there is an evidence of pulmonary edema, as you can see here. So um, due to that, the child was diagnosed with myocarditis. Um, and by definition, myocarditis is an inflammatory disorder of the myocardium, typically caused by viral infections. Most viruses can cause myocarditis, including adenovirus, Coxsackie virus, Epstein-Barr virus, and parvovirus. So multiple viruses can cause it. And honestly, any virus, including the flu virus, can cause it. The presentation is nonspecific with symptoms of fever, fatigue, and vomiting, as you can see in this patient that we just presented. They can have heart failure symptoms. Rarely, they can have chest pain, especially if the myocarditis is extending to the pericardium, where there are some um, nerve endings there, that, so that can cause some chest pain. And they can present with arrhythmias, typically tachyarrhythmias, but they can also present with bradycardia. On physical exam, you will find some tachycardia, and you may notice the S3 gallop, as we noticed in our patient. In terms of the diagnosis, you can make this diagnosis by EKG and chest X-ray. On EKG, you will see some ST and T wave changes. Um, and then um, uh, these changes will be diffused as opposed to coronary artery disease when these changes will be more localized. Um, you can check cardiac enzymes and troponin, which can be elevated in uh, this disease. You can get an echocardiogram, which will show you um, pericardial effusion or depressed ventricular function. You can go ahead and do an endomyocardial biopsy um, to get a piece of tissue from the myocardium uh, and um, make the diagnosis, although that sounds invasive and we don't do it uh, in straightforward cases. And cardiac MRI is a new technology that we have been using more and more frequently and it's coming to all parts of the world right now. Um, so uh, can be super helpful in making the diagnosis. This is how a tissue sample will look like. So these are the normal myocytes here. And in between them, you can see in uh, purple here, all of these inflammatory cells in between, uh, which tells you that there is inflammation in the myocardium and uh, myocarditis. And then if we look here, this is a, how the cardiac MRI looks like. And in this particular picture, the normal myocardium will look completely black, while if you have inflammation, it will look white. And you can see that this white band here, this white band here tells you that there is an inflammation in the myocardium and that there is myocarditis. So um, we've been using that more and more to make the diagnosis. That being said, before that was available, we made this diagnosis clinically and based on the previous available findings for years, and that went well. And in terms of the treatment, uh, for the most part, it's supportive care. We can use intravenous immunoglobulins um, that has been shown to um, help these patients with myocarditis. Um, and then um, we can use immunosuppression with steroids uh, mainly, and that's something we use in severe cases, especially in cases with severe dysfunction. And then if we fail with all of these efforts, some of these patients may need mechanical cardiac support. And I will tell you what I mean by that in a little bit. Um, so that mechanical support, as I mentioned, could include ECMO or ventricular assist devices. Now, just one word about troponin in children. So um, in previously healthy children, it can be very helpful. There was a retrospective small study of children admitted with high troponin levels and more than 50% of them had myocarditis. So it's a good test for myocarditis if you have it available in your emergency department. Cardiac troponin is sensitive for myocarditis in the emergency department or ED, but it's not very specific. And it can increase in any congenital heart disease with volume or pressure overload. So if you know that the child has congenital heart disease, it may be less helpful to get troponin and more helpful to get an echocardiogram and use your clinical evaluation to make that diagnosis. All right, so in terms of the mechanical support, so um, by mechanical support, we mainly uh, mean ventricular assist devices and ECMO. And for the short term, you can use ECMO and or intra-aortic balloons. For the long term, there are now multiple devices available for children. Um, for the younger children, we use something called the Berlin Heart. And I will show you some pictures and movies for that. Um, it's, um, 
a little expensive still, uh, and the availability is increasing worldwide, uh, but it can be helpful uh, for us to know about it. So that's why I'm gonna show some pictures. And then there are multiple um, other devices that are used long-term in adults, and some of them can be used in uh, older children who um, have a chest cavity that's big enough for such a device to fit. All right, so what I mean by ECMO, it's the Cardiac Extracorporeal Membranous Oxygenation, or ECMO. This is Dr. Barlett, who did the first ECMO insertion. And before he put it on human beings, he tried it in his animal dog lab. And, and when it's finally uh, time for prime time or for the use in humans, he used it on um, uh, this young lady. And at that time, she was a preterm lady uh, or preterm infant who had really bad um, respiratory distress syndrome and lung disease. So he went ahead and put the ECMO for the first time on her. And she is now a young, beautiful woman who um, uh, has done really, really well after that ECMO. So the way the ECMO works is that it has a, um, uh, like for, so it has two types and without going into much detail, it can be veno-arterial or veno-venous. And um, the veno-arterial is what we use the most in cardiology and in heart failure in children. So we typically will have a cannula in one of the large systemic veins um, or in the right atrium, which will take the deoxygenated blood. Um, it will run it through a pump, which will work as an artificial heart. And then it will run it through an oxygenator and a membrane oxygenator here. So the blood will get oxygenated here and will be sent back to the body through a large artery, typically the innominate artery. They can do it from the neck in the newborn uh, or they can do it um, through an open chest. And these are typically when the patient comes from an open heart surgery, um, they can put ECMO at the same time if there was some issues um, with the heart restarting and with the heart function right after surgery. It is a large device. So these are the different components of this device. This is how it actually looks. Um, so it takes almost half of the patient room and it requires continuous monitoring and if the patient is on ECMO, that means that the patient is intubated and sedated. Now, the ventricular assist devices, on the other hand, has started in 1960s, but there was a lot of effort and there is a long road until 2011 when we got the first FDA approval, uh, approval for the first device to be used in um, humans and in children. Um, so the ventricular assist devices were used for a long period of time in adults before it made its way to children's. And the Berlin Heart, um, which is manufactured in Berlin, uh, Germany, is the first device to be used in children. The way ventricular assist devices work is that it has a cannula that takes the blood from the left ventricle, usually from the left ventricular apex, and another cannula, an arterial cannula that will put the blood back in the aorta. So that's the left ventricular assist device. Um, these are the mostly what we use in children. However, as you know, in children, a lot of times you will end up with a right ventricular problem. So sometimes you will need a right ventricular assist device. And the way that works is that it takes the blood from the right ventricle and then run it through a pump to the pulmonary artery. And that's the right ventricular assist device or we can use two ventricular assist devices if the left and right ventricle are failing. So this is how that device for the most part looks like. So this is the uh, device, it's outside the body. This is the Berlin heart. And then it has a pump that sits outside the body as well. And it pushes the blood back to the body. So you're taking the blood from the left ventricular apex and put it back to the aorta. And this is helpful in cases when you have left ventricular failure. Uh, it comes in different sizes and there are also different cannula sizes. Um, so this way we can use it in a wide range of children and we can use it um, in really smaller children um, down to five kilograms or even less than that. This is the original study that proved that it is helpful in children and again, you will see that it was published in that New England Journal of Medicine, which is the most famous journal of medicine we have in the United States. And the surgeon who led that study is Dr. Fraser. He was at Texas at that time, and it was a multi-center prospective study. 
And what that study showed is that if you put the patient on ventricular assist device, there was 87.5 survival rate to transplant. Uh, so many of these patients will require transplant after you put that uh, ventricular assist, uh, assist device as compared to only 75% survival in patients who were on ECMO. So the ventricular assist device was superior to ECMO in terms of um, survival. However, what I wanted you to know as well is that these devices are associated with a significant risk of stroke. It was up to 29% in that particular trial. I think it's less right now um, as we use more um, uh, better anticoagulation, but they can have both embolic and hemorrhagic stroke. And this is something we watch them closely for when we put them in ventricular assist device. And we watch the anticoagulation strategy very, very closely. And this is the uh, curve from that study showing that the survival to transplantation was 87.5 in patients who received ventricular assist device. Um, and there was a rate of death of about 10%. So it's not a perfect thing to do, but it can be super helpful in some patients. So this table here compares um, the uh, ventricular assist devices to extracorporeal membrane oxygenation or ECMO. So first of all, in terms of the ECMO, it, uh, it usually um, has a uh, biventricular support. Um, as in left ventricular assist devices, we have only left ventricle uh, support. We can make it biventricular if we put a left ventricle and a right ventricular assist device. Um, and then typically with ECMO, we keep it only for days to weeks because there is a lot of um, you know, side effects. Um, and with ventricular assist devices, typically there is no lung support unless you put an oxygenator. It only uh, supports the heart. While with uh, ECMO, there, was, uh, there is usually a cardiac and pulmonary support uh, as there is always an oxygenator. We can also now put ECMO really quickly in patients. So if there is a patient who is deteriorating really rapidly, we can go ahead and put an ECMO very, very quickly as opposed to ventricular assist device which, which requires a little bit of more planning. Um, the ventricular assist devices in the United States work very well as a bridge to transplantation. And what I meant to show here is that the numbers of transplantation has increased over the year, but you can see that the, the number of increase did not um, increase much over the last few years. Um, and the reason for that is that we don't have enough donors. So ventricular assist devices may help a lot of patients while they are waiting for donor for heart transplant. And here I just meant to say that the um, uh, National Institute of Health, which is the main entity that supports research in the United States, funded a trial called the PUMPKIN trial, or the Pumps for Kids, Infants, and Neonates to create smaller ventricular assist devices. So this is the Jarvik device, which would be available for multiple centers to try. Um, so we can use these devices in smaller and smaller infants with hopefully less risk of stroke. As you saw with the Berlin Heart, there was a risk of stroke that's up to 30%. Um, now the VAD use is increasing. Um, so this is just telling you, this is a national collaboration in the United States to use ventricular assist devices in children. And you can see that the numbers of centers who participated in that collaboration increased over the last few years. But you can also see that the number of these devices has increased rapidly. So not just the number of centers that's increasing, the numbers of devices in each center is increasing as well. So that will take us nicely to our last case for today. Uh, it's a 19-year-old female with a history of clear cell carcinoma. Um, and was diagnosed with dilated cardiomyopathy. She underwent heart transplant two years ago and was doing very well. And now she presented to the emergency department with increased fatigability, cough, and peripheral edema. And the ED, she was found to have, a high, uh, to have hypotension. Her BMP um, was very elevated at 400. The normal at our institution is below 200 and she was admitted to the cardiac ICU. This is just a reminder about the different types of cardiomyopathy. So this is a four chamber view on an echocardiogram for a normal patient. You can see the normal size of the left ventricle and the left atrium. 
this is a patient with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. You can see that the ventricle, the left ventricle here is severely hypertrophied. This is a patient with restrictive cardiomyopathy, which is a problem in the relaxation of that ventricle and results in severe dilation of the atria. So this is called the Mickey Mouse heart. Um, and it looks like Mickey Mouse. So the atria are the ears of that Mickey Mouse. Um, and that's what we see in restrictive cardiomyopathy. And finally, this is the patient uh, we have here. So it, it had dilated cardiomyopathy. So the left ventricle, as opposed to normal, is very dilated and thin-walled in this ventricle. So just one slide about BMP in children. It's secreted mainly in response to an increase in the ventricular wall stress. It can differentiate cardiac from pulmonary etiologies for heart failure. It is higher in ventricular dysfunction compared to shunt lesions. Um, and serial PMP levels, if it's available at your institution, may predict response to therapy and overall outcomes in heart failure patients. In neonates, it can be high in non-cardiac reasons for heart failure, including PPHN or persistent pulmonary hypertension of the newborn and in patent ductus arteriosus patients. So it can be not that helpful in newborns. Now, our patient had um, anthracycline-induced cardiomyopathy or chemotherapy-induced cardiomyopathy. So she received chemotherapy in the past for her um, uh, renal cell carcinoma, and that resulted in cardiomyopathy and worsening ventricular function in her. It happens days to years after treatment the risk factors are um, higher doses of chemotherapy, female sex, uh, early age of treatment, and chest radiotherapy. And it's mainly seen in patients who are taking anthracycline, like doxorubicin, uh, to uh, treat their cancer. And now we have some, pay some medications that can prevent the injury from the chemotherapy. So dextrazosain it prevents the cardiac damage caused by the anthracyclines and can be used only if there is substantial cardiac damage is anticipated. And then the other medication is carvedilol, which is a beta blocker. But we think that the cardioprotective activity of carvedilol did not stem from um, uh, its properties as a beta blocker, but rather than from its role as an antioxidant. So as we mentioned, this um, cardiac remodeling and adverse remodeling mechanisms are very important. And it's thought that this medication may interfere with that. So in this patient, um, we uh, can treat with beta blockers and that comes from adult literature. Uh, beta blockers in adults decreases mortality, um, especially with carvedilol. Um, in pediatrics, many studies showed improved ejection fraction and delayed transplantation if you use beta blocker, and that's why we use it. And then another medication that has been in the market for a while and may, uh, you may have it available at your institution is digoxin. Uh, digoxin. It works by increasing, uh, uh, it has an inotropic effect um, and it uh, increases the intracellular calcium. In addition to that, it increases the vagal tone and decreases the sympathetic nervous system tone, which as you saw can have, um, the sympathetic nervous system can have bad uh, results on the ventricular remodeling. Um, and children require and tolerate higher doses of anthracycline as compared to adults. Um, there is no benefit in children with shunt lesions. And, and finally, we can use um, IV medications, including merinone. Merinone has an inotropic effect. It decreases the afterload with vasodilation. And it also has a lusotropic effect, meaning that it helps the heart to relax um, and thus may include the diastolic function and may improve the diastolic function as well. We have used it a little bit as outpatient therapy and was shown to be safe in pediatric patients waiting for their cardiac transplant, but it's a little complicated to send someone home on it and they require a more of a central line to go home with. Um, so it's not uh, done in every institution uh, and it's only a bridge for transplant. So just very quickly, we're gonna talk about um, heart transplantation. The contraindication for heart transplantation um, are elevated irreversible pulmonary vascular resistance, and this is something you can um, measure in the cath lab. If they have multi-organ dysfunction or failure, if they have incurable malignancy or uncontrolled infection, including HIV infection, 
um, and if they have significant psychosocial problems. And I would say um, even, uh, I know that transplantation may not be available in many countries because it requires a lot of resource utilization. The technique for transplantation, just for records, is that right now what we do is that we um, uh, kind of like cut the recipient heart and we keep um, a part of the atrium or we keep the, uh, uh, a part of the right atrium or the superior and inferior vena cava. And we also keep a cuff of the left ventricle that includes all pulmonary veins. And then we bring the donor heart and we put them together uh, to uh, do the transplant surgery. The outcomes are getting better. And now um, you can see that um, the half-life of the transplant or like this is the graft survival over time, but it can be up to 15, you know, like 15 years where half of the patients may have their transplant for up to 15 years. So it can be a viable option in the future. However, as you can see in this slide, it is associated with multiple uh, morbidities, including rejection and infection. And I just wanted to let you know that transplant even in the best institution is not a cure for um, uh, heart problems. It's actually a new condition and it's associated with multiple morbidities as you can see in this graph. So in, in this particular patient, um, we used a ventricular assist device called a total artificial heart or syncardia. This technology is now becoming more available. And what it does is that we literally cut the whole heart out and it, we replace it and it replaces both ventricles instead of having two ventricular assist devices. There is still limited experience in children, uh, but it was used for adolescents and it's a radical therapy. So if you're doing that, you're probably um, listing this patient to get a heart transplant. Um, it has better results though compared to biventricular assist devices in adults and there are no studies in children. And I just thought it's a nice thing to um, take a look at. So this is from the company website. And you can see here that um, it kind of like cut both ventricles and gives you like two pneumatic pumps uh, to replace these two ventricles. This is the picture of this patient here. And this is Dr. Morales who did the surgery for this particular patient before she got a heart transplant. So in summary, heart failure in children is a syndrome caused by many uh, different etiologies. Treatment for heart failure has advanced rapidly over the last few years with ventricular assist devices, many medications, and heart transplantation. And with that, I would like to thank you very much for uh, listening. It was a real pleasure to talk to you, and I'm happy to take questions.